Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dwayne Kimball, United States Army veteran and retired VA rating specialist. Yes, you know it. I'm bringing you another educational video as it pertains to the VA disability compensation claims process. In today's video, I'm going to explain, as a former rater, how did I rate mental conditions to include PTSD, major depressive disorder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Today's video, I'm going to break it down and explain so you know how I rated mental conditions. Let's get it. Okay, everyone, how did I rate mental conditions? Now, former VA Raider, I was trained by the VA, and this is how I rate it. But before I get into today's video, make sure you click the link below and you sign up for my upcoming webinar, How to Win Your VA Claim. As I stated before, did it last year. A lot of veterans have been asking about it. The team and I, we brought it back. Make sure you get your seat ASAP. Now, as a former VA Raider trained by the Department of Veterans Affairs, how was I trained to rate cases and how did I rate them? I rated them the way that I was trained. Now, a lot of veterans, they overthink the process. Keep it simple. The regulations are on your side. So, we all know the VA has proposed, I think a couple of years ago, to change the criteria. It has not changed yet. If it does, I will do a video and break it down. You heard me talk about it in some other videos. Do I think it's better? No, but that's just a matter of opinion, okay? But the current rating schedule for mental conditions, how did I use the rate and how was I trained? Okay, let's go ahead and get into it. Slide number one. Slide number one here, this is the rating criteria, the general rating formula for mental conditions. So. What does that mean? When you go to the rating scheduler and you look up mental, there's several different mental diagnoses, okay? So the same criteria for 0, 10, 30, 50, 70, and 100% for PTSD is the same for major depressive disorder and other mental diagnoses as well, okay? Now, you can use this same concept for any conditions as it pertains to the diagnostic code. And I did a video about diagnostic codes here recently, and I even talk about it in my book. So mental conditions. What I have highlighted in red here, 100% total occupational and social impairment. The rest of them, what does it have? Occupational and social impairment. Under each one, except the... Um, zero percent it has symptoms okay it's two separate things occupational and social impairment and then deficiencies in most areas such as work school play and then some symptoms okay i'm gonna show you how to find this information in the dbq okay and then we're going to get into how to define occupational and social impairment okay let's keep going slide number two here's slide number two this is the dbq another mistake veterans make whenever they're claiming something they don't look at the diagnostic code also they don't look at the diagnostic code and get the current dbq and see where it's their own dbq so when they go to a cmp exam if they don't have a dbq completed by their private doctor they can understand and then reasonably articulate, hey, wait a minute, I have this, I have that. So section 4A, which of the following best summarizes the veterans level occupational and social impairment with regards to all mental diagnosis? Now, I didn't copy the entire DBQ above this section and below it talks about TBI, but for this example today, the veteran does not have TBI, just one mental condition, okay? No mental disorder, uh, no mental disorder diagnosis, a mental condition has been formally diagnosed, but symptoms are not severe. Occupational and social impairment due to mild or transient symptoms, so forth and so forth. If you go back and look at the general rating formula, you'll see where these occupational and social impairments fall on that scale. 
from 10 to 100 percent. So the total occupation of social impairment, if that's checked, that's the 10 percent criteria. I'm, I'm sorry, not the 10 percent, the 100 percent. I apologize, the 100 percent. OK, we're just following along uh, on the DBQ as it relates to the diagnostic code criteria. Now, slide number three. This is the symptom section. OK, so just remember that first slide that I showed you, it had the occupational and social impairment and it had the symptoms. Now, when a rate of rates, they rate in VBMSR, I'm sorry, VBMS-R, OK? When you pull up and select, when you go into VMSR, you put the veteran social security number in, brings up the claim, they build, you have to build out all the evidence that they submitted, and then you get to the next part, and you have to select which um, body system, mental, then you have to select the diagnostic code, and then it's gonna ask you about the social and occupational impairment on the previous slide, which ones was checked, and then it's gonna bring you to a screen that has all these symptoms. And you gotta look at each symptom that's checked, and then VBMSR tell you the veteran should be 10, 30, 50, 70, or 100. Now, there are some additional things that raters can do. Okay, and I'm about to share with you how did I rate and how should other uh, raters should be rating, okay? Now, that's what's on paper in the regulations, okay? Occupational and social impairment. You have to have a stressor. Let's just take PTSD, for example, right? So let's just say the veteran was in combat. Southwest Asia, fear, hostile military, terrorist activity. That's the stressor. It has been confirmed. They file a claim, they go to the exam. A lot of veterans, they don't know how to read or articulate how that stressor affects their occupational impairment and their social impairment. So occupational, your job. Have you lost a lot of jobs? Do you blow up at your coworkers? Has it got to the point where you have to work from home full time due to your home being a safe and protected environment? Okay. So that stressor, okay, fear of hostile military terrorist activity, being in combat, how does it affect your occupational impairment, your work, social, how does it impact it? You don't like being around crowds. You don't like loud noises. You're a recluse. You're paranoid, okay? Uh, you, don't, you know, you go to the grocery store right before they close or right when they're open because a lot of people are not in the store. You don't go in the gas stations. If you go to a restaurant, you sit with your back to the wall so you can see people coming and going. Listen to some of those examples I just gave you. And then that's how you reasonably articulate that to the examiner at the CMP exam, because that's going to determine which box did they check. If they check total and social impairment, it's 100%. Now you get to the symptoms. Get the DBQ. Google the symptoms. What is the definition of some of these symptoms? And check the boxes yourself. When you go to the exam, you can have the DBQ with you and say, Doc, I meet with these symptoms. And if they check that along with a certain level of, of social and occupational impairment, that's going to determine if you get the 0, 10, 30, 50, 70, or 100%. Now, what I'm about to share with you, you don't know about this. And a lot of accredited agents and lawyers don't know about it. When I would rate, I would look at that DBQ, right? I would look at the stressor. Yep, it's been confirmed. And sometimes the vet may submit some additional information from their private examiner. Or there could be some different, different information in Capri. And the Capri is the website or the system that is used by the VA Medical Center to house all your progress notes. VA employees at the region office have access to that. So I will look through there. And so let's just say on the uh, DBQ that was completed by the CMP examiner, the veteran wants a 70%. But there's other information that shows that veterans should be warranted 100%. I can bump that veteran up to the 100% even though the DBQ shows 70 as long I, as long as I can justify it, 
with the evidence of record. Okay, now, let's just say that DBQ is at 70. The Raider can drop it down one to 50. But they have to explain themselves in the narrative of the rating decision or that will be an error. So if you are submitting progress notes from a private examiner for a mental condition, look through it, see what's in there, okay? Also, you have to be careful because I just did a video about can the Raider use evidence against you? When you go to these VA medical centers, go to My Healthy Vet, see what's in there. So let's just say you've been getting treatment and you've been telling them, hey, things are not getting good. Um, they got you on medication and, you know, you're just not, you're always depressed or your PTSD is really acting up. But somewhere in those records, it says, oh, the veteran is doing better. And if that's not the case, what can you do? You can send that examiner a message in Blue Note and secure messaging and tell them, hey, you wrote this on this particular day, that is incorrect. I am not getting improved. I'm not improving. Guess what? The Raider can see that. Okay? Just drop the nugget. A Raider can see that. So that's why I talk about invest the time to get educated and understand these things. Now, should you have to do all this? No. But what government agency makes it easier to get money? Just like the IRS, right? You file your taxes, you got to go and get all this documentation. It's not what you say, it's what you can prove. The VA is no different, okay? So those are some nuggets, but be able to reasonably articulate your symptomology as it pertains to your stressor for the mental condition that you're claiming, okay? And be able to break it down and how it affects your social and occupational impairment and what symptoms do you have. It is simple as that. Do not overthink the process. So with that being said, make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification button, and don't forget to share this video with your fellow veterans. Thank you.